welcome to the latest video. This one's about my most memorable gigs and I'll tell you all about it after this. Hello, this is my list of five of the most memorable gigs I've ever been to. Now this list might change from time to time and if it does, if I think of more exciting ones or equally as exciting or not quite as exciting but close, I will do another video. But at the moment after a bit of thought, I gave it about, what, 20 minutes thought as I went to empty my rubbish this morning. So it's not a definitive list, but I think you'll find these are the five very interesting shows. And the first one has to be... Chuck Berry at the 100 Club. in Easter Sunday 2008 or 2008 however you want to say that and I've already done a video about that and there's a link up there somewhere if you want to go and watch that it was a very successful show everybody seemed to enjoy the show and I got to meet one of my musical heroes actually it's quite surprising to me how many people don't know that Charles is Chuck Berry's real name and that Chuck is short for Charles or oh, that Jimi Hendrix is actually James Hendrix because Jimmy short for James did you know that maybe that's not true but the Chuck Berry thing certainly is true because his son is also called Charles and I also know him and he's a very nice chap too it was a very eventful weekend because obviously putting on one of your heroes is always a thing and he had a reputation for being hard to work with now I must say which I said in my video about it that I didn't find that at all true we had a couple of chats which again is something that most people say that they haven't done I have and I really enjoyed them and I got to know him and I really liked him actually but it was very trepidatious to work with one of your let's face it Chuck Berry is possibly I mean up there well not possibly up there he's up there with people like the Beatles the Rolling Stones well he's like without Chuck Berry there wouldn't have been the Beatles or the Rolling Stones so he was a hugely influential act more than anyone else in the 1950s people say to me Jerry Lee Lewis <laughs> Perkins, people say, or Bill Haley, or Elvis Presley. Whoa. Chuck Berry was all those people times two because Chuck Berry wrote his own songs, he played his own music, which not all of those people can say. Like, in fact, Jerry Lee Lewis had hits with Chuck Berry songs, the first. I, th I think actually Ike Turner should be in that list too. <laughs> We put him on the 100 Club, which is only a small club if you don't know it. It only holds 300 people, nine below zero, who with the support act, we put them on, who would normally be a headline act for me at the time. And it was very good. Now, Mark Lamar was the DJ. We, we did charge a lot, actually, to be fair. It was, I think it was £149, which in 2008 was quite a lot. But you've got to see somebody like Chuck Berry, who would never normally play in that size venue, play in a very small club. And I know he enjoyed it. In fact, at the end of it, when he came off stage, Matt Lamar played a record, and Chuck Berry said to me afterwards, I was going to go back on and do an encore. So there you go. That was a great show, and I really enjoyed it. You guys are fun to play for, you know. It's very nice. <laughs> Just feels like the basement, you know. 2008 I was looking for acts to book for the Rhythm Festival which is the 5,000 capacity music festival I booked which was held at that time in Clapham in Bedfordshire at Twinwood Arena and I was listening to the radio on the internet because in those days iTunes that they had all these radio stations around the world and I liked listening to album stations 
in the United States, especially college ones, because they didn't have adverts or didn't have many adverts and played lots of interesting music. And I came across some music. I think it was a student station in Pennsylvania, but it might not have been. I might just be making all that up. So I sent them an email to the station, asked what it was that they played, because it was after I just caught it and then it was gone and then they played it something else. But it haunted me to that piece of music. Anyway, luckily the people got back to me and said it was a track by Gandalf Murphy in the Slambovian Circus of Dreams. online and I found their website and I played some more music and I got into their stuff and I, th I think I might have bought their first album which was out then. A good beef tips is had. This band sounded good and I thought why don't I bring them over and I watched some live stuff I think on YouTube so I knew they were a good live band. So anyway, cut long so short, I got in touch with them and they got back to me and said yes we want to play at your rhythm festival and can you get some more gigs and I think I said I could and I think I put them on at the 100 Club. Agreed it and they came over and so there's a lot more going on which I don't really want to go into because it's like very boring mate more than being a bit secretive because you know me I don't mind sharing my all my secrets with you but I am very nervous about getting boring which reminds me can we just take a pause and if you like what we're doing on this video and you like the other videos or think you might like my other videos please subscribe press the notification bell and um, you will be notified when I do more and you don't have to watch all of them but if you could watch them all the way through that would be good because often especially with this video I leave the best till the end so just to let you know there's a little secret people have got this far because a lot of people believe it or not I can't understand why watch the first 30 seconds and then stop watching them but anyway, it just really ruins my YouTube stats. So if you watch it all the way through, that'd be great. And if you like it, please like it down below. Press the thumbs up button. If you don't like it, then just don't worry about it. And um, comment, let me know what you think by commenting. So let's get back to this thing. So secret, I was gonna tell you this little secret, wasn't I? Basically what it was, at the time, I was, the Rhythm Festival started in 2006 and it was held at this place called Twinwood Arena, as I say. And it wasn't a financial success. Artistically, everybody seemed to think it was great, a fantastic idea. I was basically getting a whole breadth of acts that I thought the people who go to my shows at the 100 Club and people like us, like us really, would enjoy. So I chose bands and acts that were good. Obviously you have to have headline acts that are going to draw people in, but my idea was that every act would be hand-picked and that's the way it went. So that's why I got this Gandalf Murphy and the Slambovian Circus of Dreams, because I thought they'd be very good, and they were. So in the meantime, because it wasn't a financial success, I'd had to do a deal with the people who owned the site, Twinwood arenas and we formed a new company called Twinwood Festivals and I was a director and I was one of four and I had a I was a minor shareholder obviously because I was not put it and they were going to take over that 2008 festival I'd already booked it they did try to basically it went wrong but we'll come to that later so we'll we make up that later because it's a bit boring we booked them and they played on the Friday night opened it and then they played on the Sunday morning I think they were the first band on the main stage on the Sunday morning now, it was raining. I, I do remember that. Not like heavy torrential rain, but a little drizzle. And I remember standing there with my wife and son, and we were watching them, and they did do a song called Sunday in the Rain, which was extremely appropriate. It's nine minutes long. And I was standing there watching this, and I had tears running down my cheeks. And it wasn't just the rain. I pretended afterwards it was just the rain, but it wasn't. I was actually crying. Because it was such a moment. Well, bear in mind, I'm also very tired at this, at this stage. Even though I wasn't personally involved in the actual ups and bolts of it all, I was, it was my baby. Gandalf Murphy and the Slambovia Circus of Dreams have changed their name a few times. Um, they've been called the Grand Slambovians, they've been called, um, I think they're now called, I think they're now called the Grand Slambovians. 
or there might be the grass lowies, and or there might be the oh I don't know what do I know anyway they're a great band check them out I'll try to put a link in the description down below you can check out their website they are touring the UK um, I think they're looking to do a tour next year they were supposed to do this year doing I think they're going to do Crop Ready Festival which is the Fairport Convention Festival and um, the one that my friend Peter does and it's gone right out of my head I'll try and put a thing up there what it is and I'm sorry Peter I forgot your name of your festival but I shall put it up there I have a lot on my mind at the I've just had an eye operation actually I've just had a cataract operation so I can actually see now I can see that the lens is there and it looks all very spacey very interesting so anyway all that's because I happen to be listening to American College Radio back in 2008 and heard this great track on the radio and Here's something for you, here's a motivational thing. If I could have just heard it, thought, oh that's quite good and just written it down and maybe I maybe just like forgotten about it. But if you want anything good to happen, you've got to take action. There you go, motivational speech. Now what's the next fantastic gig I was at? I wonder. I can't hear you. Are you ready to sing? <laughs> Alright, now go sing that song, I do. The next gig is not one gig, it's like a whole series of them actually. It's with my friend Desmond Decker, the reggae superstar, the king of ska. I was his agent in the 1980s. It was fair to say that he wasn't at the peak of his career. A fantastic live act and it was a big show and the band were very good. You couldn't always get him a lot of work, but when you did get him work, it would be packed because it would be rarer. Steve at Marriott could play in London probably three or four times every week, 52 weeks of the year, and they'd all be pretty packed. Desmond Decker would probably get more people, but he would only play possibly once every month, maybe more, maybe less. Again, you see, we're going back 40 or more years, so it's hard to say. But anyway, I put Desmond on many times, so I've got, so I'm putting this in as like a, an amalgam of all the shows I ever put him on. Like I put him on at the 100 Club many times. That was probably the best place to see him. I put him on at the Cricketers before that in the 80s. That's a much smaller place. But my memories, because that's far to, that was a long time ago. But the 100 Club shows were, very sweaty, very excited, and he always put on a fantastic show. Delroy Williams, who is still a friend of mine to this day. I need to explain to you. I, myself, and Glenroy Oakley from the Greyhound, we cannot sing like Desmond Decker. But to keep his music alive, we try our best to make Desmond proud of us and to make you proud of us. He was like the um, toaster and Desmond's friend and manager. And when I was Desmond's agent, Desmond, Delroy and I had our ups and downs. We had, they were, I think they were very suspicious of everybody. I think it took a long time for them to get to know me. And I think Desmond in the end, and Delroy I know, we were friends after Quite a while though, because we started up, I remember once we were doing a show at the Red Lion at Brentford and they were questioning how much they were getting paid and I wasn't putting the show on, I was just the agent, so I want to get the, get the cash because it's normally traditional that when the band is actually goes on stage you get paid. So as they were on stage, Desmond and Delroy, I went and got money and I still remember it was okay. With these situations there's always room for doubt, like were there... 450 people in or were they 460 people in? That sort of thing. So, and I remember paying him and they were saying that it wasn't right, that there were more people in. I'm going, no, it's, it, it seems fine to me. And there's not a lot you can do about it, to be honest with you, except just not to play the place. And again, and, and anyway, this became heated. And in the end, I just took the money and said, oh, tell you what, it, and it might have been about my percentage, I can't remember now what it was, but I just said, look, take the lot, I don't give a, just take the lot. And I beat out of them and stormed out, not taking anything for myself. So the next day, I'm at the office and Desmond and Delroy, 
turn up to see me and I think, oh, they've come to apologise, we're going to be friends again, they're going to pay me my commission and we're going to be, and they sat down and um, Des, the, the Desmond in these situations normally didn't speak enough to, to, to Delroy and Delroy said, we counted the money you left us on that and it was 80 pounds short or something, so they wanted to pay them another 80 quid. Anyway, so we got over there, we became friends, but I tell you what, Desmond Decker put on such a great live show and he was one of the greatest artists I've ever seen. Died far too young. We also shared a birthday, 16th of July, and occasionally we'd all meet up like Desmond and Delroy and me and, they, and we meet up and have a drink once or twice at the Half Moon at Putney. Once I can remember, we were with Gino Washington, who I was also waiting for, obviously a friend of Delroy's and Desmond's. Gino Washington and his wife Frenchie and a few other people, I can't remember exactly who it was. And so we're sitting at this table outside and there's a band playing in the back, I can't remember who it was, it was no one I particularly knew, I don't think. But while we're sitting there talking, I know it's Jimmy Page. Walk out of the room, because he's obviously watching the band that was playing in the back. Walked out of the room and into the Gen Storos, and we were sitting on the table quite near the Gen Storos. And he obviously recognised Gino and Desmond Decker, and they had a total double take. Right, so, and the strange thing was that they didn't notice him, so there you go. So, that was fun. Desmond Decker, at any of his shows, he unfortunately died too young. He was out jogging, apparently, and a dad of a heart attack, which is always a thing I would warn people not to do. Get to a certain age, do not go jogging. That's my advice. I've lived the age of 67 without ever doing any jogging. And believe me, it's probably best not, not to sh and shake up all your bits. That's what I, th I would say that my cardiologist would disagree with that 100%, so there you go. So don't listen to me, listen to my cardiologist. There you go. Go jogging, but try not to die, okay. July the 17th. Um, it was the day after my birthday. I was, I was 21 and somebody bought me a ticket to go and see Bob Marley and the Whalers at the Lyceum. Sadly, I don't remember who it was who bought me it and I can't remember who I went with, which is awful, isn't it? And that, if that was you, I do apologise. But I don't think it was my mother who bought me the tickets. I think it might have been a woman, and I think I went with her, which would make sense because it was one of the best nights of my life. And I can remember, the strange thing is, I can't remember anything about what it was like outside the gig. And all I can remember inside were some very specific things that happened. For example, this is where Bob Marley and the Wavers recorded a live album and where they specifically did No Woman, No Cry. Now, I didn't realize this till quite recently, that they did it two nights, and this was the first night, and the second night apparently wasn't as excited or as good. When I was there, my mind was blown. It was the best gig I'd ever been to at the time. And inside, it was incredibly hot, and I think they opened the roof, because the Lyceum at the time had a roof that you could slide open with a motor. And I believe they opened it after well, I can remember saying we were with a pint of beer and liquid was dropping in to my beer, which wasn't good. I think it was coming condensation off the roof. It's so hot in there. Middle of July, and it was so hot in there, and the atmosphere, and it was packed, absolutely packed. I've never seen the Lyceum as packed as that. I think they must have had like 100,000 people in there. Not really, but it was really packed. That was one of the best gigs I've ever been to. And I can remember leaving there on a total high, I mean, which might have been something to do with the with the um, substances in the air, I don't know. And I stayed up for days afterwards. It was just like one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Bob Marley and the Whalers at the Lyceum in London, 17th of July, 1975. Interesting enough, I don't know if, if I've mentioned this previously, but when I was a, a social secretary, I was sent by Island Records, or their agency, I think they had an agency at the time, the original 
pressing of Catch a Fire, the flip top. It, it was like a lighter, like one of those, um, we call those lighters, I don't know. Anyway, if I still have that, it would be worth apparently £4,000 now. But I don't, because all my records are long gone. But I can remember playing it at the time, and I did try and book Bob Marley and the Whalers, even though nobody knew who they were at all. And the price was £75, and I can't remember why we didn't get them. I think we booked them, but then they cut short their tour. I think that Bunny Whaler left or something, and they cut short their tour. But it was a great night out, I'll tell you that. One of the best nights of my life. And totally memorable, what, um, 45 years later. Around the same time, or slightly after the Bob Marley show, I was at the Rainbow Theatre in Fitzroy Park for the Clash. <laughs> it was December the 14th, I think it was, because I had to look online to find out which night it was, because what happened was, we were in a pub, which may well have been the George Rovey across the road, probably was actually, and so we arrived just as the well, one of the support acts, apparently we'd missed Shamrock 69 and there was a special surprise support act which I believe was Richard Hell and the Voidoids and we arrived in our seats just as that was over. Now at that time the seats were quite, because it was a whole totally seated venue, the seats were quite, everyone was sitting down, people were standing up and talking to their friends maybe, the Sex Pistols had been on the thing with um, Grundy, whatever his name was, and caused all the outcry and all the papers had done it. Uh, they're heroes, not the nice clean Rolling Stones. You see, they're as drunk as I am. They're clean by comparison. They're a group called the Sex Pistols. Dirty. What a clever boy. What a well, so it wasn't that long after that, so there was still this thing about punk, it was still dangerous, it was still people who I knew who were straight, shall we say, I want a better word, when they knew I went to see someone at the at Clash or went to punk gigs, they were appalled, they were alarmed, that's not something that nice people did, because it was like so edgy, so weird, it's very hard to put it across how different things were then to how they are now. But it was like somebody, by doing these things, by going to a show by the by the Clash, now bear in mind they were doing three nights at the Rainbow, which I think holds 2,000 people or something like that. So they were quite big by this time. So we got there just afterwards, we were a bit drunk, we tried to sneak some beer in, I recall, but we were stopped by security on the way in, and then the Clash came on, and again, the Clash, I'd seen the 101ers, which was Joe Strummer's previous band at the old game, but that wasn't really the same sort of thing. They weren't really a punk band. They were high energy mostly, although Joe and the band did smoke a lot of dope, it appeared, but they were sort of a, they were like on the Count Bishop side of the pub rock thing. They were Dr. Feel Goody, high energy. So it wasn't like, you know, like uh, Country Blue. I hadn't seen the Clash, I don't think, but I probably had done because I used to go to shows at the Vortex and places like that. And the and bands at like the Clash would be like on a bill, you see, like three or four bands a night, and you'd win. Who most of them were because you'd only see this is the thing now. People say, Oh wow, look, the Sex Pistols are playing. Oh wow, the Clash are playing. Oh, Generation X playing. But at the time, most of the bands that you saw, you only saw once because they only played three or four times maybe before they decided to call it a day because it was generally a spontaneous movement. People had formed a punk band just and just played. So anyway, Wrist the Clash, they were obviously not in that ilk. They were obviously rehearsed, they were obviously doing things. And people say there was a total riot there and it was again reported in the mainstream press. There was a total riot and it was like, it wasn't. In fact, I remember that people jumped on seats and danced, yes, but when a seat broke, which did quite, not, I mean, I didn't break a seat, my, my seat was working, but when it did, people, not where I was sitting, I was sitting at the um, top, in the balcony, I think, but people in the stalls passed the forward, the broken seats, I don't know why, but they did, so it wasn't like the pictures that you see in the press show them with like, holding seats in there, that's because they're passing them forward, they're not smashing them and throwing them everywhere, so it wasn't really a riot, it was a riot, it was a great show, it was a fantastic high energy show, and at the end of it everybody left there, and I remember it wasn't that late, and I remember the, the pubs ought to have been open, but every pub quite close there had, had, had the doors closed, so they didn't want us in there, so that's what it was, we, we were like dangerous, how exciting eh, to be 
absolutely dangerous. I'm certainly not dangerous now, age 67. But what? Well, maybe, maybe I am. Maybe I will. By the way, if you're wondering why there's not more music on this video, that's quite simple because the people who own the copyright, and it's not often the artists themselves that normally sold it to somebody or lent it to somebody, and that means that person, whoever it is, is normally a corporation, a big corporation somewhere. They, if I was to put the music on here, you're not really allowed anything. I do tiny little um, snippets occasionally, hoping it won't get caught out. But it often, sometimes is. And if it is, they will then, the person who owns it, who probably isn't the artist, will then claim the copyright for the entire video. Not just like for that little bit where the music is, but for the whole video. And the first person to come along to claim it gets the copyright. And they can say where this video is shown, if it is even shown. I think it's all a bit, a bit of a scam, really. But obviously, the work I'm putting into this is my work. I'm choosing to illustrate it with little bits of music and things. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm helping the artist by promoting them. I'm not trying to use their hard work to um, make it appear as though I wrote that music or I'm performing it. No, I'm helping promote it. So there you go. Just to let you know, that's why I'm not playing much more than music. I'm playing as much as I can and I hope you appreciate it. If you like it, please like, please comment, please let me know what you think. If you were any of these gigs, and always subscribe. Please subscribe, press the notification bell, and then you will hear, first of all, before anybody else, what I'm up to. And thank you for watching, and uh, there you go. See you next time, hopefully. Goodbye. That's all, folks.